Well, it's nice to be back with another uh, episode of Lacrosse Talks, and uh, this is a really special uh, discussion we're going to have today. Um, you know, I I uh, love going to the movies, and uh, the last lacrosse movie uh, I had seen was Crooked Arrows, which was a lot of fun. It was like Mighty Ducks, and then this past year, I somehow got an invitation to go to another lacrosse movie. And uh, I, I went to the movie and uh, I was blown away, not because of the lacrosse, but by the uh, other parts of the movie. And we're gonna talk about uh, the movie, The Grizzlies, and I'm really pleased to have with us here today, Russ Shepard, who is the real live coach uh, that was featured in that movie. And just find out a bit about Russ, find out about how the movie was made and what it meant to the community. And, you know, I have a million questions uh, about that and just really glad that, uh, Rush, you were able to join us here today and, uh, you know, be part of uh, this uh, building up of history that we're doing through the Canadian Lacrosse Foundation. Yeah, well, I really appreciate the, uh, the invite and very humbled to, uh, to be here with the, um, the type of people that I've seen uh, within these videos. Yeah, it's, you know, we want to capture this history for posterity and, you know, the movie The Grizzly is going to be around for a long time and uh, I think it's important to know it from the inside out uh, because it does feature lacrosse as uh, one part of it uh, and uh, want to see how that all came about. So tell us about your coming to the game uh, before uh, you even thought of moving up to the far north and, and just, you know, the beginning. Yeah. So, like any kid in Saskatchewan, it was hit or miss in our in our communities on whether there was lacrosse or not. Outside of you know pick up phys ed class lacrosse, we didn't have anything organized in in Esther Hazy where I grew up. Um, there was some lacrosse that we had heard about in our area in Yorkton and Sturgis, Saskatchewan, um, but we didn't have you know a, a good lacrosse person in Esther Hazy. When I got to University of Saskatchewan to do a teaching degree. Um, I was introduced to a sessional lecturer named Al Lusick, who's you know a pioneer of lacrosse in, in Western Canada, I would say. And you know Al's passion for the game was totally infectious. Um, I loved coaching, and once I picked up a stick and went out with Al, and, and you know he kind of got our skills going, I realized that I just loved the game of lacrosse. It, it was it was pretty uh, quick switch that was turned. Um, and so I, uh, I started to coach in Saskatchewan while I was in university through, uh, through Saskatchewan Field Lacrosse and Al. Um, first team I coached on my own was out in Aberdeen, Saskatchewan, the Aberdeen Hornets. Um, and then shortly after that, I got my first major teaching job up in the Arctic Circle. So that's kind of my roots in. Um, I'd love to say I had an illustrious playing career, but Al will watch this video and tell you otherwise. So. Uh, so it was really through the passion of Al and, and the game itself and the discipline of the game that I really kind of uh, took a big liking towards the sport. So, you, so you're in Saskatchewan and then all of a sudden this opportunity to go to the far north to, to teach comes about. Was, was it an automatic yes from you or was it a, a time to reflect on it a little bit and make a decision later. Yeah, it, it really was an automatic yes. It's, it's, I've been asked that question a few times as this movie has played out. Um, I got a, I had an interview, um, obviously over the phone, and then a job offer came in. And I was a social studies teacher, um, and one of the things I realized very quickly was I do nothing about this area of my own country. A Little bit of shame on me for not knowing that. But I had been brought up in a home that was very open and welcoming and, and multicultural and, uh, you know, it really intrigued me, um, this opportunity to go to our north to work with, you know, students that I knew nothing about in a culture I knew nothing about and just to try that adventure out. And so, 1998, I jumped on the plane in, in August and was shorts on in plus 20 in Saskatoon and landed in you know, minus four and snow in, in Kugluktuk, Nunavut. And how old were you then? I was 23, just turned 23. Wow. Yeah. Just right out of he, university. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah, as green as it gets. And, yeah. uh, you know, one year, I was going to go for a year and see how it went, and yeah. one became seven. Unbelievable. And when you got up there, obviously you had 
some culture shock right from the very beginning, I'm sure, uh, about where you were living and, and what the school was like and what the kids were doing. And uh, talk about the, you know, those first like week, weeks uh, after arriving and what that, what that was about. Yeah. Flying in, I, I'll never forget flying in. It almost makes me emotional to, uh, to talk about it because I just remember the vast tundra. No trees, lakes, rock, but how beautiful it was, which is really mind-numbing because a lot of people would think rocks and lakes, it's, but it was absolutely stunning flying in there. Um, when I landed, I had great support network with some of the teachers that were there. Um, Mike Johnston was a very influential teacher for me and a great human being that I worked with. Um, and yeah, the, there's, there's social problems, like there is in every community in, in North America or the world. And what I, the phrase I was told right away from Mike was that these are great kids, they're just some of them aren't great students. And that phrase really sticks with me today. You know, the students in general and Inuit people, um, you know, where I call home now, Kugluktuk, were very welcoming and very family oriented. Um, and very supportive of people coming into their community and working with them. Now that doesn't happen overnight. You have to take some time and put some time in and actually care. But once you've earned that opportunity, it's an unbelievable experience. And like I said, it's why I still call that area of, of Canada home to me. Now, it's just as an aside, did you take to the, the diet that was traditional up there right away or? No. Or you know. No, the diet, the traditions to a point, um, caribou, um, musk ox meat, arctic char, of course. But the, you know, I'd say the traditional diet has, has transformed uh, quite a bit. Um, food costs are very high, so you do what you can to try to get healthy food. But, you know, you'll see some of the old pictures of me. There, there wasn't a lot of healthy food going in my body some, some of those days up there. So like raw, raw seal is a delicacy and did you try that or? <laughs> yeah, I did try it. Yeah. Uh, it's not top of my list, <laughs> um, but it is, uh, it is a very uh, popular food. It's a very popular traditional food, yeah. as is caribou. Caribou would be the most popular, caribou and char. Yeah. And I love those. I used to, you know, caribou hunt every year and love to go get char. Wow. Um, but yeah, it, you know, it's such a clean diet when you're eating traditional land food. Yeah. There's nothing better than getting a fresh char from uh, from the Coppermine River. Oh boy! Yeah. Now, did you did you have your lacrosse stick with you on, when you went up? Yeah, I sure did. I still remember the sticks I had. I had two sticks with two me. Two sticks. So that's yeah, nice. I had a Warrior Barracuda and a non-offset STX. I can't remember the name of that stick, but it was just an old old plastic stick. But I had those two sticks with me when I first moved up there. Um, didn't introduce lacrosse right away outside of through phys ed. Uh, there's just a, I think my first two years up there, I uh, was, was probably not in the same head, head space I was the, the next five. Um, the, you know, there's definitely some cultural divide that can happen in a place like that. And sometimes teachers or workers from the South can perpetuate that. I feel like my first two years up there, I maybe hung around with teachers and didn't integrate in the community enough. I didn't learn or respect the culture enough. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, students didn't respond to me the same way. We had a very difficult second year um, with, with suicides in the community. Um, it was, you know, very defeating in many ways. Um, and so we got to that spring and I kind of had to make a decision if I was going to come back or not. And my decision was if I'm coming back, I'm not coming back the same way. I'm coming back and actually going to try to contribute to being a good community member and a good teacher for those kids. And I came back two weeks after I left. I went away for summer holidays for a short two week break and came back and that summer introduced lacrosse. And that's, okay. that's how it started going. I, I want to just walk back just a second because I yep. thought you only were going to go up for one year. Yeah, so my original contract was a two-year contract, but of course you could leave at any time. Um, you just didn't get your removal allowance. So it was a big deal when you're 23, 24 years old, you know, six, $8,000 removal allowance. Mm -hmm. So after my first year, which wasn't a hard year socially, it was really, you know, getting kind of ingrained in teaching. Um, I made the decision to come back for year two just because, you know, I had some things I wanted to do and, and 
but year two was a big decision at the end of year two for two reasons. First, at the beginning of that year, I knew if I didn't, if I wanted to leave, I could get paid removal out. Right. If I re-signed, it would be an indeterminate contract. And that means, you know, you have to do, I don't even know how many more years to get any removal allowance, but, but year two's decision really hinged on the amount of, of community suicides and problems we have. And we had that year and, and, uh, you know, I remember some some dark days and and sitting in a, in an office in March and April and and really trying to think about what I was going to do. Right. It, what would happen at the school when there was a suicide? Like, what? yeah, every teacher deals with it differently, just like every student does. Um, our school, we would be notified. Um, the first day of my second year, we were notified that one of our students had passed, had taken his life, um, and there's no right answer on how you deal with that. And then they don't, you know, they don't teach you that at teachers' college or at university. And so my philosophy was that, and I adopted this throughout my time up there, that this classroom right now needs to be a good, emotionally safe place for people. And if they want to come talk to me, they can come talk to me. But right now, I'm going to teach math because some people just want to kind of ingrain themselves in doing something else. And so it was an open environment in my classroom. Um, I didn't sit in a circle and talk with students um, necessarily, but I had an open door policy and, and we, you know, just created an environment where, where kids could feel safe emotionally. So grades became very much secondary at yeah. that point. Yeah. And it was yeah. more uh, the person in the long run uh, yeah. that was more important. Absolutely. And yeah. I think, I think the biggest lesson I learned from my students up north is grades are secondary. Yeah. Grades are one yeah. measure of success, and they're, they're not really sometimes the most important indicator of success. Okay, so you, year two was, was horrible, or not easy at, to say it in the very best way, and you made it to the end of year two. And what, was there a day when you said, I'm coming back? Like, like, do you yeah. remember that? Yeah, I do, I do. And, and I'll just backtrack. Yeah. It, it was a very hard year, but wasn't horrible. The resolve in the students was, and, and Inuit people and community members going through these difficult times was unbelievable mm -hmm. to watch. It was unbelievable to see how they were able to deal with death um, and sudden death and to see that inner strength. It was really inspiring in some ways, which is why I think I made the decision to come back. But I remember the decision was made in about mid-April. Um, and the decision was, once I made it, my attitude was, it's got to be right because I just made it. And now I'm not going to look back. Let's just move forward. But the decision was made to come back and actually change what, what was happening in our school. I feel like our school culture, and this is no slight on the teachers or, or principals that were there, I felt like our school culture was very stagnant. Um, it was, you know, very typical. It, it was students didn't come to school, so we sent the bylaw officer go to talk to the parents. Well, why don't we create an environment where students want to come to the school? Why don't we turn the culture of the school to be something that is inclusive, but also exclusive, and exclusive being People wanted to be there. It was the cool thing to do. And so we came back that fall, and in October, the Kuglukta Grizzlies was born. The logo was born from a student. It was polished up by an artist in Saskatoon, and you know, I'm wearing it on my chest today. So it's interesting. You, you actually, in year two, became the student. And Western culture doesn't deal with death always in the best way. Yeah. We avoid it, you know, that sort of thing. And you just saw people that... Uh, somehow knew how to to handle it in, in his best way uh, something as tragic as that can, yeah. can be right and I, I think that's quite a brilliant way to put it Jim and I think the one thing I love about the movie is how they flipped me into the student and because I really feel and that you know I probably haven't verbalized it the way you just did I think at the end of year two I realized I was the student on this ride and I'm gonna see it out and see what I learned so it, when you announced that you're coming back for year three what were some of the reactions uh, from students and or teachers around? well it wasn't a big fanfare parade or anything like that it was pretty quiet I decided to come back students were you know students that I had built a relationship with were excited 
but some of them were just kind of oblivious because teachers before had probably said they were coming back mm -hmm. and then it's who's in there on September 1st. Um, Show me. <laughs> yeah, and, and teachers were very notorious for, you know, we leave on June 28th and we're back August 29th for start. Well, when I showed back up on July 15th, it was shocking. And I remember students were like, why are you here? And then there were students hanging around town with nothing to do. Yeah. So I started opening the gymnasium every night. And more for me to get into shape because I had put on a couple of extra northern pounds. Um, but we started doing pickup sports at night. Yeah. And one of those sports we did every night was lacrosse with the old intercross sticks. Oh, that's they, all we they, had. They, that's had a, all they had a bag of those. Yeah, there, that's yeah. all we had. But the <laughs> kids became very good players quickly. And I had gotten some, somebody in the South to send me 20 non-offset old school heads. I think maybe like this, <laughs> this SDX one here. Okay. Um, but uh, that's, that's the birth of the Kuglukta Grizzlies lacrosse team was that oh. summer. We had maybe 14, 16 kids that would come out and play. And Good core group. Yeah, to, 18 to, months later, we had probably 80 kids playing. 80 kids. Yeah, wow. out of 140. You know, in the movie, they'd show the games played in the gym at night and the whole community out to, to watch and cheering for the different teams. Yeah. And is that all pretty accurate? Yeah, so we, what we tried to, it's very accurate. What we tried to do is say, okay, we can't, it's very expensive to fly south to play. Right. And parents aren't going to come and watch. And, you know, because it's, you know, $5,000 trip to go to Edmonton. <laughs> yeah. So for our lacrosse team, you're looking at a $30,000 trip just to get our team down there. So how can we get games in town? We don't have a field, it's cold. So we played in the gym, we played pickup with box lacrosse equipment, three on three, yep. four on four, all different ages on the floor, but you, you know, you just figured it out. Yeah. And we called it the KLL, the Kugluk Tuk Lacrosse League. <laughs> we had three teams all made up from students. And it follows the movie, the movie follows it very well. And I remember there was times in that gymnasium, there was a, uh, a mezzanine above the gym where the fans could sit yeah. and it being so loud that you couldn't hear the referees whistle in there. <laughs> and I'll never forget the very first KLL Cup, which we called the Aghawk Cup. Aghawk is grizzly in Inyanaktun. So I went into the dressing room for one of the teams, the Wolf Pack, and there was young Kyle in grade six, who's portrayed in the movie yeah. by Boo Boo Stewart, and his legs are just shaking. And I said to him, what's wrong with you? Are you okay? And he said, I'm so nervous. And I realized at that moment, we've created a Stanley Cup yeah. or a World Juniors <laughs> or whatever you want in Kugluktuk for it these kids. Something. It meant everything. Yeah, yeah. It meant everything. Uh. And it was really a, a chilling moment for me <laughs> to see how much it meant to these kids, right? Wow. And so a team won that night. And the Wolf Pack won for sure. And the Wolf Pack. Uh, they, they had bragging rights for a number of weeks, huh? Yeah, they, they, yep. they, they we used did. them? Yeah, we did. did. <laughs> yep. we, I mean, I was the impartial uh, coach <laughs> slash, yeah, no, we, all of us adults kind of picked a team and the Wolfpack was my team. So. Oh, is that right? And yeah, we okay. had some heated games. Okay, so how, would you have like four teams in the league? Or three. Three teams yeah, in the three, league? Three, the Wolfpack, the Flaming Crosses, um, which of course, if you're not a lacrosse person, you're like, why are you bringing religion into this? But <laughs> um, and then the Warriors. And uh, yeah, we ran a three-team league every year. Yeah, it was great. Wow. So you got an idea, like we all do, about taking our teams somewhere. I remember I did that in girls lacrosse, took a, them out to a tournament in British Columbia from Ontario, yeah. and greatest you know, oh, week to ever yeah. you know, bring them all out and let them see something new, right? And uh, So you got the idea to tr bring them south. And, and you know, you talked about the expense. Like, what, 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 were you, what were you thinking about getting it done? Like, well, how, like yeah, first we, we couldn't play South. We weren't a registered member of Canada Lacrosse, so you can't come play in a tournament. Um, so I contacted the Canadian Lacrosse Association. Um, a guy named David Mirigway was working yeah, there at that yeah, point. Yeah. And David Mirigway put me in touch with Jim Burke. Um, Jim Burke. And, yeah, and <laughs> Jim Burke was the president of Canada Lacrosse then, and, and I will say um, Canada Lacrosse was instrumental in assisting us. They paid for us to come down, for myself to come down to their AGM to you know, give them kind of an mm -hmm. idea of what's happening. They voted us in as an associate member, Nunavut Lacrosse, 
which had 25 people in it, um, and then gave us a green light to come down to tournaments. Um, so it was, uh, it was a great experience, but we, once, we, once we were able to come and participate, we had to make some decisions on when that was going to be, and it was May Long weekend in Edmonton at the Ron Welts Memorial Tournament. Mm. And I believe 2003, might have been 2002, um, and yeah, it was... <laughs> it was a crazy so, tournament. So what was, you must remember how much that, that was going to cost. I bet, I'm 30, sure that number was... 30,000, 32,000. <laughs> yeah. And so, okay, okay, where does 32,000 come from? <laughs> well, part of being, part of my philosophy as a person and, and Team Grizzly when I was there is fruits of your labor. Um, getting handouts from people doesn't help you feel good about it. Mm -hmm. So we fundraised and we fundraised hard fundraising lunch hour hot dog sales, bingos. I mean, we did all sorts of fundraising in the community to come up with that money. Team Grizzly was very aggressive. We had teachers that were very in, in a positive way. And so we wanted to branch out a little bit. Um, so we opened up a, a, a kind of a youth center arcade at night, but we generated revenue off of that. Yep. Um, and that revenue went straight back into Team Grizzly into things like these trips. So we, we basically just, you know, worked our butts off, taught the kids what, and then, you know, what I always loved is when you get on that plane, so I'll just tell you a quick story about yeah. that first trip. So these kids work their butts off for months and months to fundraise twenty five thirty thousand dollars $30,000. We get onto the plane. I don't think anything of this. We fly into Yellowknife. We've got about a 30, 40 minute layover in the Yellowknife. So it's not a lot and I'm missing a player. And Yellowknife Airport is not a big player. And I'm missing a kid named Randy. And I'm like, where is Randy? And he said, coach, he's up in a tree. I said, what do you mean he's up in a tree? So I go outside the front of the airport and there's Randy up in this tree. Randy hadn't seen a tree, right? And wow. so those are the moments I remember about that trip. A lot of kids had never flown before, a lot of kids. So it was like really mind blowing mm -hmm. that they were gonna fly and then fly on a big jet and then go to a big city of Edmonton and then go to the West Edmonton Mall, it, you know, as overwhelming as it was for me, I cannot imagine what that trip was like for some of those kids. The, the, the game of lacrosse was a small part of that trip. Yes. A yeah. Very small part. Yeah. Now, obviously, through DVDs and the, and the web, I guess, they yeah. were able to see the outside world. Yeah, so of course, it wasn't yeah. like they had, but they never actually physically. Yeah, experienced been in, a lot of those things. <laughs> Some of you guys have worked through a lot of crap to get here. A lot of stuff, okay? Not just getting up and going to school. And you need to think about that. You deserve to be here. Now let's get our sticks in here. Let's go! Let's go! Let's go! Let's go! One, two, three, three, one! The Grizzlies did not win a single game in the Nations Cup tournament. But they played. They cheered they survived and for the kids from Kugluktuk that's hope and that's enough so you went to there did you get your butts kicked uh, completely or, or you know I can imagine when you meet yeah. established areas yeah. it's hard to get traction yeah <laughs> the uh, the biggest problem we had is we had played in a gymnasium so there was yeah. gameplay. We had very good stick skills. We had a lot of players with good stick skills, but they didn't have any game knowledge. They didn't even know how to change. They didn't know any of those things. So we get into our first game, and the other team picks up the ball off of, you know, their goalie or off a shot clock violation probably, and they start running down to our end, and I got five kids on my team coming off the floor. <laughs> I'm like, you can't change on defense. So, you know, one of the... You know, most interesting comments that was said to me was AJ Joma. I'd met him that weekend for the first time. He was coaching the junior B minors. They may, they weren't junior A yet. And he came up to me at the end of one game and introduced himself. And he said, coach, I really want to comment on and how exceptional your team was in that game. He said, when I walked in to watch their effort, I thought the game was a, you know, a six, five or a <laughs> seven, four game. I looked up, it was 14, nothing. He said, for you to have those kids working that hard in the third period of a 14 nothing game says a lot about their character. And those are the types of compliments you pass on to the kids, right? Because there's not a lot of, if, if you're worried about the result, you forget about the process. And 
what those kids taught me a, more times than not was the process was what was important, not it's the result. It's almost like the grade thing, right? In a different Exactly, manner. like the grade thing. Yeah. The process of coming to school, of accomplishing, having attendance at school, of you know, passing a course, is sometimes way more important than the result of what that mark is. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. So that, that's year three. Did you actually get down there in year three? to? Edit? Yeah, I believe it was year three. Yeah. It was spring of year three. It was May of year three. We would have gone down there. Yeah. yeah. So that, that so was 2002. Pretty, yep. That was a pretty good rebound from year two and all the things that had happened in year two. Yep. Uh, yep. We had a clean year as far as um, some of the suicide problems. Um, we started to really get some energy in our school and it, it wasn't lacrosse is the focus point of the movie. Right. It was one of six or seven different things going on. You know, our basketball program was very profound. Our soccer program, I coached volleyball. It was probably our most popular sport. Um, we had music programs. The whole school culture started to shift. Mm. And what happened is kids started to be proud to be a member of Team Grizzly, started to be proud to come to school, right? It used to be if you went to school, you were kind of an outsider. Now we started to flip that culture a little bit on its head. And, and then year, you know, year four hit and we hit the ground running. Um, I think year four is when we went to field nationals for the first time, somewhere in there. Um, as a U16, you know, um, participation team. Again, you know, the CLA and, and the field sector really instrumental in helping us get there. Where, um, where was that again? Uh, that was down in, I want to say it was in Red Deer, but it might have been in Calgary and we stopped in Red Deer on the way. Again, I'm getting those mixed up a little <laughs> bit, but um, it, I think it was in Calgary. You know, we played in the Alumni Cup, which was a lot of fun as a participation team. And, yeah, again, it was the process of working hard to get there, right? Now, did you ever get to Toronto? Toronto was not, although it's a big focal point in the movie, <laughs> yes. it actually wasn't one of the locations that we played at. We went to, we often came down, and again, using Al Lusick, yeah. um, we would come down for about 10 days, and we would go to Saskatoon, and we had a good hotel there that was really cheap, and we would play and Al would come and practice with us every night. We'd play his Scorpions team right. in exhibition games and Al would come out and help us coach. And so we were developing these relationships with Saskatoon, but also getting games in. So, you, you know, you come down for eight days and you get, you know, nine games in versus four. Mm -hmm. um, but we, uh, we went to Winnipeg, Saskatoon, Calgary, Red Deer, Edmonton, and then, uh, I think that's it. So as we're moving through year four, year five, and so on, what was happening to you uh, in, those, in those years, like transition year of year three? And yeah, I think, I think um, that's a good question. I think probably personally I was, you know, just really enjoying the experience of learning what, char what true character was. Mm -hmm. I, think, uh, I think that the... You know, I'll give you some examples. So there's some characters that are in the movie and then there's some characters that aren't in the movie. But one of the things you probably notice right away when you watch the Grizzlies is that these kids come to school after going through some enormously harsh stuff. Mm -hmm. But when they show up to school that morning, it's normal for them. That's not normal. It's not normal for a young man to still make it to school after being up half the night with the, you know, something really violent going on in his house. Mm -hmm or a young lady coming to school after her dad has been on a, you know, a five day drunk bender and has been, you know, very aggressive. I used to see that every day, not just in one or two kids. We're talking the mass, yeah. right? And it's not a slight on the parents. There's a lot of residential school issues that need to be dealt with in this reconciliation yeah. process that needs to take place in Canada. But far and beyond the character in those kids was mind numbing to me. Mm -hmm. And I just started to develop this admiration for the kids I was working with, which success breeds success. So I would see that success and it would, you know, trigger for me to work harder or do more to get more success for, you know, opportunities. I'll just jump forward a little bit. I, I don't want to get to where I'm going to later, but Kay. end of the movie, they show the real life uh, kids yep. as they're grown ups. Yep. And so many of them holding really responsible positions oh. 
in the yeah. community. And, you know, first of all, that must have made you feel fantastic to see that come out of yep. what came out of the, the whole experience there. And uh, Oh, they're all good friends, yeah. really good friends of mine. And it's always emotional for me to, to see that. Um, but it's also, you know, expected. Like, I knew those kids. I knew them when they were little, you know, grade seven and eight, nine kids, and I saw that character. And our job was to simply be a door opener and, and allow them to kind of go through it. Huh. So you get into year five, year six, and you, things are going as well as they're going to be going, I guess. And yeah. when did you start to think about year seven and what might happen? Uh, then do you know was that something always there or you know what every spring was a is it time to go or is, am I staying every year became more and more home I bought a house up there I owned a house I had a nice patio overlooking the ocean you know I started to my land skills were getting better and better although some people up north watching this might not say so um, I developed strong, strong friendships with people that are still very good. So it, it, it's, it yeah. was home, it, it still is. When I, when I went back there to show the movie, when I was part of the <laughs> release in the community, the first person I saw off the plane was an old student who said, hey Shep, welcome home. First thing. <laughs> um, Boy, that makes you feel good. Oh, and, and <laughs> like, and emo again, very emotional uh, a ride. But year seven, I, I think I started to realize I, I needed to do something else for the program. I think the program, for health's sake, needs to kind of get some new direction and new energy. Yeah. And also, I had some things going on personally. I had, you know, some, my parents aren't getting any younger at that point. I wanted to be able to enjoy them and, and see my mom a little bit more, who was quite sick. So it was a very, very difficult decision. Mm. Um, you know, I think I probably made the decision about March that year. Mm. Um, yeah, it was, it was hard. It was a hard next you two months. You were established there. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was a very, and, and I don't think I understood that I'd be walking around for the next 18 months in the South wondering what's next. Right, right. right. You didn't know yeah. what the next, you just knew you needed to get back because of family. Yeah, and, and that kind of thing. the North spoiled me, right? The North spoiled me. You go into teaching, um, to try to have an effect on a kid. And right? it, it actually d was a place where your impact could be felt. Yeah, and, and on mass. So right. when you leave that experience, you go to teach in the South, very different protocol, very different hierarchy. You get caught into this situation of what's next? I, I, I had this which is a pinnacle. Mm. Now, how do I follow that up? Early in life, you yeah. Have that. And how yeah. do yeah? And how do I follow that up? And it was very up and down next eighteen months for me, for sure. Oh. Yeah. Now you're teaching now, aren't you? I'm a lawyer now. Oh, yeah. lawyer. That's right. Yeah. 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 So you actually left teaching after a I, while. Yeah, I went down and I worked in Edmonton at uh, Edmonton Public. Um, worked at the Vimy Ridge Lacrosse Program and helped build that with Paul yeah. Rye. Um, and then I went out to the Hill Academy and worked with a yeah. friend that I had met through the North, uh, you know, Brody Merrill and, yeah, and the Merrill nice. family. Yeah, yeah. And I was there and then I came back and got into law school and, and then now live in Cranbrook, BC. Wow, yeah. wow. That, that's, I can't even imagine when you were in year five, say, what you'd be doing right now. Yeah. <laughs> I can't even imagine. And, and, and the pathways <laughs> and, and just the way things worked right up North. And, and how the dots connected and how you met, you know, how I met Chris Sanderson at a t-shirt booth in Baltimore and how that totally changed the direction of my life and direction of a lot of kids' lives and how instrumental that was and how through Chris I met Brody and then that led to me being the dean of students of that school. Like Kyle, Kyle Miller as well. Kyle Miller was, you know, yeah, you met, you unbelievable. Met incredible people. Unbelievable there, you know, humans yeah, that yeah. really allowed me to learn from the best about you know, character about, uh, you know, about what it takes to not be an athlete, but to be a good human being, right? Yeah, as you say, those people, like, like there's no fluff anywhere. <laughs> it's like no. direct. <laughs> and, and, and <laughs> Just, you know, yeah. I meet Chris Sanderson at a t-shirt yeah, booth yeah. in 2003 mm -hmm. at the World Cup, under 19 World mm -hmm. Cup. And Chris Sanderson runs a company called True North and says, well, I want to come up north and do a camp because I run True North. <laughs> so we worked it out and he came up and did a great camp. And the first thing I could see when I watched Chris work with youth 
because that's what caring looks like. Because it didn't matter where he was, mm. he enjoyed the ride and he, those kids loved him, right? Mm. And I really picked up a lot from his energy. Yeah, yeah, yeah special. Uh, Very special guy, yeah. Yeah, um, well, let's jump back to the, the actual nuts and bolts of the movie. Okay. And how, like, you signed rights at some point but it took a long time yeah. after that. So maybe explain to people how all that came about to finally yeah. get on the screen. You know, so CBC had done some pieces on the Kugluk Tuk Grizzlies program, um, which are still on their archives. I think they're very well done pieces. Um, you know, very caring reporter named Jennifer uh, Hunt at that time did them. Um, Peter Mansridge picked them up. From there, the American Indian Law Alliance, which is you know works with the United Nations on First Nations rights, um, brought a bunch of us into Baltimore. The Baltimore Sun did a piece. A very caring producer from ESPN named Greg Jewell read that piece, took you know took a liking to it, and decided to try to work. And two years later, was up in the Arctic, shooting uh, shooting a you know an eight minute documentary that was. Tele televised on their biggest audience sports center of the year, which is the college um, Final Four selection show. The word game, sometimes people think of it as being sort of superficial, but in fact it's not. Particularly team sports, I think, can be a very profound experience for those people who are lucky enough to, to play them. Early September, Winnipeg, Canada. The under-19 lacrosse nationals. Eight teams fighting for the cup. I said last night you owe it to the territory to be out here and work hard. It's more than that. You owe it to yourselves. All right? But for the team in red and yellow, this is not just a game. This is something deeper. This is survival. Around what years were those, just to give context? Yeah, I want to like, say that that um, was aired in 06. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, 06. I want to say it was aired in 06. Um, but it might have been 05, so don't quote me on that. So but anybody right, who saw that was like, holy cow. No, it was 05, because I was still up north. Mm -hmm. It aired in 05, in March of 05. And I remember, because I went into work and hit send and receive, and I had... I had no idea it aired because we didn't get ESPN right. and Kugluk took. <laughs> and there was 800 emails coming in. Oh. And I thought I got spammed. And the first oh. email I'll never forget was from a head coach of a Dallas high school football program saying, Coach, I watched your piece last night on ESPN. It brought me to tears. Great, great job for all your work. It's sometimes depressing. I've got a few relatives here that uh, are pretty heavy into drinking. 16-year-old Kyle Aviak has seen alcohol and drug abuse lead to violence. His father would beat his mother in front of Kyle and his two sisters. It made me feel like I didn't want to live anymore. It gave me tough times. I thought about killing myself a couple of times. And so, of course, I hadn't seen the piece yet, so I was like, well, gee, I want to see this now. Mm. But um, once that piece aired, um, you know, the phone started ringing for people that were interested in what we were doing. Young people here just quit. And that was their way of not dealing with some of the life problems. They quit life. Fresh from college in Saskatchewan, Russ Shepard arrived in Kukuktuk in 1998 unaware of what he'd discover as a new teacher at the high school. Suicide attempts were off the charts. Suicide almost becomes acceptable. It's almost, and it, it was, and, and maybe still is, um, to a point, almost an acceptable means of dealing with problems. In Shepard's second year here, more crosses were planted in the cemetery. Three teenage boys killed themselves in a span of just five months. Overwhelmed by those losses, Shepard faced a decision. Change the kids' mindsets or leave. 
I can't stand by and teach kids um, and, and have good relationships and a lot of fun with them to come to school the next day and see an empty desk because they killed themselves. I mean, it's not something I want to do. Shepard had an idea. Give the kids something to care about. Give them a purpose. So, he gave them lacrosse sticks. And I called it their girlfriend. I said, if you have that stick with you all the time, you sleep with that stick, you eat with that stick, I said, get your mom and dad to find a place at the table for it, give it its own chair. He created a school lacrosse program. He called it Team Grizzly. It was a game Shepard grew up with, but the kids had never seen. They did not know the rules, did not know the strategy, did not have a field to play the game on. It didn't matter. I think when the kids play lacrosse, essentially what happens is they lose themselves in the game. You don't have to think about your dad that's beating up your mom or you know your cousin that committed suicide. You forget about your problems. They're not there, they're non-existent while you're on the field. Since Team Grizzly formed four and a half years ago, there has not been a single teen suicide in Kugluktuk. Zero. A town near the end of the world found its center through a game. I probably wouldn't be here right now if, uh, if uh, there was no lacrosse here. And, uh, and from there, I signed a, a, a life rights deal um, with uh, Jake Steinfeld, who, who then sent yeah. those rights to Miranda de Pontier. And you can't ask for a better person than Miranda de Pontier to work on this project. And, and her commitment, her energy, her empathy, and her um, understanding um, of how long it would take to do it right. And then her bringing in people like Graham Yost, who's a, a very accomplished writer, and Moira Wally Beckett, who was leaving the set of Breaking Bad to come work on this. Mm -hmm perfect group of people to tell a movie that could not just be a sports movie. You know, it wouldn't have done it justice, right? And that was my number one concern. Are we and so, uh, it, because they wanted to leave something, like this movie was gonna be the catalyst for an industry. In, in the north yeah. and because of that it took probably twice as long to actually get it done because it, of the expenses of doing it up there of yeah. creating people who could work on it up there yeah. uh, you know from what I've read uh, you know that it made it into a, you had to be committed to, yeah. <laughs> to see this through yeah and my my part was easy they would call me and say we need to interview you for the script and then I'd fly to Ottawa and get interviewed for two days and then go home Miranda's commitment to getting proper actor training in the North to pick actors from the North as best as she could to like on set, every single um, position had either Inuit people in a high role or a training role. Um, so she wanted to leave a, a proper footprint up there. Um, but her commitment to the actors and the acting was remarkable. Some of the best acting in that movie is done by you know, people that like, I mean, I picked Miranda, the character of Miranda. So Emerald is, is the real actress's name. She was my neighbor up north. She was five years old when I lived up there. Truly my neighbor. She wasn't an actress. She, you know, went through the process that Miranda had in front. And I thought in that movie, um, she not only played Miranda to a T, but was an overpowering um, female role model. Haven't you figured out yet that I don't know what the hell I'm doing? So you get our hopes up, change things, and then you walk away? It's not that simple. Looks pretty simple to me. Now, r remind me, was that the young lady who kept track of all the funds being raised? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. she was really special. And Very special. Quiet, but strong. Which is Miranda yeah. to a T, <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. I, I got it. So, okay. How did it, how was it finally like, this is really going to happen? You know, how did, yeah, that, yeah. how did, you know, you heard that probably 20, 30 yeah, times. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, it's a funny process. I actually didn't ever think it would come to be a movie. And, yeah. and I'm sure even because there'd be times I'd have to talk to lacrosse people like, you know, Al or, or Jim Burke or some of those guys. And, 
you know, I remember when we were at Nationals in Winnipeg, we had to get permission because ESPN wanted their camera crew on the field, like beside the field. And people were up in arms and they thought this was a documentary. And I got word in February of, when did it release? Of 2016. So February saying, we're making a movie in a month. There were some swear words in there from Miranda um, <laughs> saying, we're making a movie in a month. We need you on set. And I'm like, Whoa. So that's really the first time it was real. that I knew it was going to be made. So if yeah. you think, you know, 2007, you signed those, right, those rights, you're talking nine years. Yeah, nine and I still wasn't sure it was real <laughs> until I saw that they were actually up there on set. And then when I flew up, and, you saw everything. and of course, there's, yeah. throughout the process, you're not sure what the quality of film's going to be. I read the script, right. but the script I read and the one that was finally made is still different. You don't know how the music... There, there's still, for me, a big concern right until the day I watched it in Toronto, which is the first time I is really right? watched that it. That was the first yeah, time. At TIFF. There's yeah. still a big concern for me that this is A, some type of cheesy white hero movie, yeah, which is yeah. not what happened. Right. B, that it is a really B-grade movie as far yeah. as you know, the production of yeah, it. Yeah. And not that I didn't trust them, but I just don't know the industry. Right. When I watched it in TIFF at Winter Garden Theatre and 1,300 people gave about a you know, seven-minute standing ovation, <laughs> I mean, it was totally overwhelming at that point. Bad scene for a lot of the kids up here, eh? What's being done? Nothing that works. Sports. It's worth a shot, isn't it? What have you got to lose? Whatever's left. That's something else, huh? Yeah, yeah, it really was. And as you say, it's not a lacrosse movie, but it's a lacrosse movie. <laughs> it is. It's funny <laughs> yeah. for lacrosse people, it's a yeah. lacrosse movie, but... Yeah. Oh, it's uh, so much... Uh, you, know, yeah. you know, it's, it's yeah. just a beautiful piece of what strength we have in youth human, and, yeah. and what our role is in this. The human condition. Yeah, yeah. But, agreed. Yeah, the power behind. Um, so it's, it's uh, now being shown. I saw it uh, either the first or second night uh, that it was aired at Scotiabank Theatre yeah. in Toronto. Yeah. And, I, I understand the U.S. is looking at signing onto it, or, or what, how is that? Yeah, going? the U.S. Yeah. distribution is supposed to happen in 2020. I don't know the exact month yet, but there is a distributor that has signed. I think about a year ago. Um, so I don't know how that's going to look. I'm I'm happy being the last to know that stuff, um, but it is going to go to U.S. distribution. It did very well in Canada, um, well beyond my expectation. I can't tell you how many people random people that have nothing to do with sports have said, gee, I watched that movie. It was really, you know, mind blowing how, how it was portrayed. What a beautiful piece. Again, credit to the kids because it's their story mm -hmm. and a credit to the director and writers for putting that together the way they did. We've been dealing with this stuff for years and we're still here. You get knocked down one time and you're going to run away. This is not about you. So you, you, you're working hard with the Grizzlies up, up north and you learn so much there. You're the student and they're the teachers. And, but you can go all through the world and find places where the kids need help. You know, it's, it's universal. And what, do you, what are you finding that you learned up north that you might be using down south now? Yeah, so I think there's probably two big messages that I have been discussing throughout this journey, um, you know, in keynote speeches with adults or students. The first as an adult and, and a coach, teacher, parent, you can't fake caring. It, it's something you cannot fake. And I've asked this question in, you know, a student body of 1,200 sitting in front of me and an adult group of 10. I've said, raise your hand if within 30 seconds of talking to a person, you know whether they actually care about what you're saying or not. And it's almost unanimous that their hand goes up. You can't fake that. So if you don't care about what's in front of you, you have to find something you do care about. First of all, it's fulfilling for you. But secondly, your engagement and your ability to um, move forward with that movement will be, you know, magnified. Spring, what are you doing here? Same as you. A girl? Uh, no way. Way. I care about seeing youth reach their potential. It's always been there for me when I was, 
you know, my parents were foster parents and I grew up in a home where the expectation on me was, you know, this child who just came into our home is now your brother and you're going to make him feel comfortable and we're going to try to help him get to the next level, whatever that is. And so, you know, I was blessed with parents that really pushed that into me. You had a training ground. 100%. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's one group of people that I always thank. Both my parents are, have passed, but um, they really set the tone for me properly. Mm -hmm. um, but outside of that, I would just say, you know, you, you can't fake caring. It's either there or it's not. And I think my success is because, you know, whether if you want to go about it in route A or route B or route C, as long as you care, you'll get there. This, the second thing, and the second message that I see in programs in the South and kids in the South and adults, is don't ever underestimate the power of the human spirit. Each of us has had it tough, real tough. But we're a family now. Our team, we made our own family. And we got each other no matter what. It, it's such a cliche, but it's a cliche for a reason. When you watch the Grizzlies movie and you see some of the hardships those kids went through and some of the success they've had, really sit back and think, that's true. That happened. And it's, I'm really happy about one particular part of that movie. And that is there were four, five, or six students focused on and one Russ and not one Russ, one student. Because there were so many different stories of kids that were even left out of that movie that could have been told of you know, perseverance, of hardship and getting through it and their human spirit. And then I, you know, I moved to Edmonton and I, I started the Edmonton Razorbacks with a gentleman there and we saw the same thing. We saw a group of kids that didn't know how good they could be in lacrosse. And then we created this culture within our program and we had kids going to Yale and Albany, you know, and then, and then I went out to the Hill Academy and I saw what the Merrill family has built out at the Hill Academy and it's an amazing culture out there yeah. of family and of commitment to the to the hill feather and then I moved to Cranbrook and we've built that within our program there and I know working with Al and his and he's built it there and it's a culture of you can do it if you just put some you know sweat equity into it and have some high expectations of yourself you can get there and I really think that's a message that you know transcends borders absolutely transcends borders I say we stay strong we do what we came together to do, what we trained for. We play. Um, I think, uh, you know, Tom Rinaldi said it in that ESPN piece. Um, you know, he, he made a comment at the end that sports can become more for people that need it to be more, right? And, and I think that that really saved true in, in this case. And it, it might not be sports, it might be music. I don't care what it is, just latch on to what you need, right? Yeah, latch on to the vehicle, that'll get the, you Exactly, out of right? Um, you know, and, and the, the saying at the very uh, end of the Grizzlies, I don't want to be a spoiler alert if people are watching this that haven't seen it, you know, but what lies behind and, and you, know, you know, it's an old saying, it's, it's all about what lies within that's important, right? And, uh, and I love that scene where, where Ben, the much more handsome version of Russ, is walking up on the hill and he's and you know he's basically saying it's it's what lies within um, that's important and and my students taught me that and that's the best phrase to end that movie on I have another question you what was Ben like when you met him oh he was um, great guy unbelievable human being um, he was very humbled to be playing a role that was so meaningful you know, he had a comment to me that a lot of actors work their whole lives to play one meaningful role, and he's doing it, you know, before he's 30. Hmm. And he was really learned a lot about raw emotion, he said, from, from the kids up there. I don't want to put words in his mouth. Um, but he was, he was fantastic to work with and, and a consummate professional. You know, I had to coach the lacrosse scenes. I was the lacrosse coordinator yeah. in the movie. Um, and they were hard because I only had like a four hour session with the actors to teach them how to play. And so Ben came and sat in the corner of the gym and listened to me so he could start to pick up how I talked to the kids and how I worked. 
and then started to implement that on set, it was actually pretty remarkable to see how hard he worked to become more authentic to what I was like. Had Ben ever picked a stick up before this? Right before the movie, when he got picked for the role um, or signed his contract, he um, picked up a stick and started working with some pro players in New York to learn. And actually, his stick skills were, were pretty good. <laughs> I, I kind of laughed on set that his, uh, you know, I probably have a heavier outside shot, but his inside game looks like it could be better than mine. <laughs> wow. So I wondered, I wondered, after you left, uh, did the league, the KLL, keep going? Or, or, or? Well, it's like any program, right? Um, it morphs and changes. So any school is dependent on the teachers within. Lacrosse faded off a little bit, not the next year, but it, you know, a couple years later. Um, other sports that had teachers in town you know, came to the forefront maybe a bit more. Um, but Team Grizzly was never a lacrosse team. It was, it was, a, it was a, a movement. You know, it was a movement of, of passion, of kids taking responsibility for themselves, of people working together. You know, I, it's funny to see the critics um, try to turn this into something to do with race or critics trying to turn this something to do with, you know, uh, negative things. What really happened in the North was adults and students, you know, brown, white, whatever, connected at the heart and worked hard for each other and had each other's backs. I mean, hmm. that's what happened. Right? N not easy. <laughs> not easy, but, <laughs> but, but it's remarkable what can happen when that. When you see that. Exactly. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the, the, the students that they showed at the end, are they in different cities across the north now, or, or, or like, or? Yep, yeah, they are. Spread out. Now? Yeah, they are. Um, winter, I believe, is just moving back from Ottawa, but there's kids kind of all over the place. Yep, Kyle's still in Yellowknife. I see Kyle every second year. He comes and visits me out in the mountains. Um, we're working right now on a project called Team Grizzly, which is going to be a consulting project where those kids are going to be able to go and work with different communities that maybe need those the, you know those stories and that uh, the direction from those kids um, so we're going to start piloting that here in the spring um, and and see if we can help you know like i was in red deer i was talking to a, a group of high school students 1200 students and i had a young girl come up to me she's 15 and she said you know i used to a year ago right now well this was a year ago in april she said I was suicidal, I was cutting myself, I was really in a bad spot. I went to the Grizzlies at the Cineplex and watching Miranda made me realize that I had more to offer. And now she was kind of a leader in her school in working with some counseling, peer-to-peer -peer counseling. That's what we need out of this movie. We need Miranda to go work with people to become more like Miranda, right? And, and, and no one can refute the story that they tell them because yeah. they lived it. They lived it. It's true, yeah. and it's on the screen. Right? Well, good, great. You know, uh, best of luck with with that. And yeah. I hope it really works. Yeah. And uh, you know, just a real pleasure to hear this story um, in its depth. And uh, you know, this is now down for posterity. So uh, hopefully, Grizzlies will keep going over the years, and more people will see it. And see it as uh, the movie that it is uh, with lacrosse as part of it, uh, yeah. you know. Yeah, and I, and I appreciate the opportunity. I, I believe my role in all of this is, is simply to, you know, tell the story of the students that I dealt with up north and, and make sure that adults understand that it's not about the adults a lot of times. It's about the kids in front of you. And, I mean, I've coached in multiple programs across the country and the one thing that's always been the same in all of those is the character in front of you with those youth. It's, it's absolutely amazing to see that. Well, thanks for being here, Russ. Thank you very much. This is not about you. All of us have made sacrifices to be here. We've been dealing with this stuff for years and we're still here. Instead of drinking or fighting, we are proud, strong, full of hope. Who are we? Really? Oh, no, no, thanks. I'm just running. From, from what? 